Thank you all for joining us today for the webinar entitled Documenting Appalachia's Diverse Communities Through Historic Preservation. My name is Danielle Parker and I am the Executive Director for the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia. Before we get started with the webinar, I would like to share that we will be taking questions throughout the webinar and the panelists will answer those at the end. You can submit questions through the questions tab or send chat messages. I will also be sending two links through the chat that are relevant for this presentation and I'll send those through the email as well so you can check those out. And thank you to WVU's public history students and Dr. Jennifer Thornton for volunteering to share about their work today. I will just get us started and hand it over to Dr. Thornton. Thank you, Danielle, um, and thank you to PAWV for organizing this webinar series. So like Danielle said, I'm Jennifer Thornton and I teach public history classes at WVU. And I'd like to welcome you all to our panel today, documenting Appalachia's diverse communities through historic preservation. And what this panel is going to do is highlight the work of students in history and public history at WVU on two recent projects we've been working on. Um, the first is looking at the history and built environment of Saberton, which was a largely working class and immigrant neighborhood in Morgantown. And the second project is one that was researching historic African American schools throughout the state. So I'm not going to speak long. I'm going to turn this over to our panelists. But first, I'm going to introduce them and also recognize our community partners on these projects. So um, our first two uh, panelists today who will be talking about the Saberton Project are Elizabeth Satterfield and Jordan Riggs. Elizabeth Satterfield is currently pursuing two master's degrees at WVU, one in public history and one in public administration. She is a West Virginia native and an alumna of the Preserve WV AmeriCorps program. Jordan Riggs is also a West Virginia native and is a second year graduate student studying public history at WVU. She has worked at several Civil War battlefields, Ogle Bay Mansion Museum, and most recently at the US Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. Our third presenter, Adrian Thompson, just graduated from WVU this spring with a major in history and double minors in Native American studies and Appalachian studies. Throughout her time at WVU, she has focused on public history, historic preservation, and archival research on topics related to West Virginia history. Finally, our last presenter today, Jamie Billman, is another current public history master's student here at West Virginia University. She also has two bachelor's degrees, one in media studies and another in anthropology, and is currently serving as an AmeriCorps member. So ever since the public history program was founded at West Virginia University, applied work and community partnerships have been a cornerstone of the program. And that's still true today. Um, these projects would not have been possible without support and community partnerships. So I wanna take a moment just to recognize those. Um, the Saberton project was really spearheaded by the Morgantown Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, and they uh, acquired funding, grant funding, from the West Virginia SHPO to support the project. Uh, the consultant who worked on this project was Aurora Research, Research Associates and the CEO, um, Courtney Zimmerman, was really an amazing partner and an excellent mentor for the students on this project. For the African American Schools Project, we had a lot of institutional support. We received grant funding from both the Provost Office and West Virginia University's Humanities Center um, to support the project. We also worked closely with Bad Buildings, which is a member of the Abandoned Properties Coalition, as well as with archivists at the West Virginia and Regional History Center. There's an oral history component of this project, and that would have been impossible without the collaboration and partnership of Professor Mary Kay McFarland at the Reed College of Media. So I wanna thank all these partners for their support and hard work on these collaborative projects. And with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Jordan and Elizabeth. Hello everyone, this is Elizabeth. Uh, thank you Dr. Thornton for organizing this panel and to thank you Danielle for um, putting together this webinar series. We're very excited to be able to share our research. Um, even though now we're online instead of in person, it still is exciting to be able 
to talk about our research and our work in Saberton. So um, we, as students at WVU, worked in Saberton in the fall of 2018. Um, there were both undergraduate and graduate students who were taking historic preservation classes at the university. And we, as Dr. Thornton mentioned, partnered with the Morgantown Historic Landmarks Commission and uh, Courtney Zimmerman with Aurora Research Associates to conduct a survey of Saberton. Um, next slide, please. So for those not familiar with um, the geography, Saberton is a neighborhood to the east of Morgantown in Montegalia County. Uh, Saberton is uh, now mostly a commercial area with some residential structures, but it was founded in 1902 um, as a completely separate town and was mostly uh, in, had industrial sites and a lot of working class um, and immigrant residents. Um, it was later, the Saberton was later annexed into Morgantown proper in 1949. As you can see, Interstate 68 runs right next to Saberton, and when it was constructed, there was some loss of um, historic structures at that time. But um, if you're ever on Interstate 68, you probably see the Saberton exit um, and a lot of the commercial buildings that are there today. Next slide, please. So here you can see the survey area that we were working in. So the image on the left shows you um, there's four different areas within Saberton that we surveyed. So the first is West Saberton, which is there in um, the bottom uh, left, towards the bottom left. And this is on the other side of Decker's Creek. If you're familiar with the area, this is around Elgidid Street and Diamond Avenue. Um, then there were a lot of structures around both South Lestravia and North Lestravia. Most of these are residential structures, but there were a few still commercial buildings still standing, um, a few homes that are more in a high style, and as well as a school that was standing at the time of um, our survey. The last area we surveyed is called the Norwood Edition, which is um, at the northernmost part of Saberton. This was not part of Saberton when it was founded originally at the turn of the century, but was um, built later um, up, up through the 1950s. So some of the homes in that area are a bit newer than um, those along Lestravia Avenue. And you can see there on the right image is uh, a zoomed in version of um, the area of North Lestravia. And you can see a dashed line and that's where we had recommended a small historic district to be created. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But there should, I think Danielle was putting in the chat um, a link to access um, Courtney's report that has all of this information. So if you would like more information on Saberton um, and elaborate on what Jordan and I are talking about today, then I would um, encourage you to go to that link. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to all the field work we did, um, and the field work mostly we consisted of we go out and um, we were doing historic property inventory forms. Um, and each of us did um, usually about eight, I think, and there were 18 students that worked on this project. But in addition to, fill, to doing these HPIs, uh, we also did a lot of primary and secondary research to complement our field work. And this was conducted at primarily the West Virginia Regional History Center, which is located in the downtown WVU Library in Morgantown. And students looked at um, collections that range from Board of Education minutes to Daughters of the American Revolution um, archival material, a housing study of Saberton from 1914, records from the Women Christian Temperance Union, as well as corporate records from the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company. Uh, we as students also looked um, and utilized the U.S. Census, um, Morgantown City Directories, historic newspapers to learn more about the people who lived in Saberton, where they lived, where they worked, um, what their families looked like, what households looked like. Sandborn maps, um, which are insurance, fire insurance maps, were also very helpful in understanding the historic landscape of the area. And then for the properties themselves, we conducted de tax and deed research through the county clerk's office at the courthouse. Um, some students also looked at secondary sources such as books and articles and many of these are local in nature. So I would encourage anyone who is doing research, uh, community research, like uh, community history research or neighborhood um, histories to look for local pieces that already exist to complement your own research. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan to talk a little bit more about the history of Saberton. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so as we said, uh, Saberton was founded in 1902 by George Sturgis. And so he's a prominent businessman and politician in the Morgantown area. And the land was originally 100 acres of farmland, as you can see in the second image. Originally, it's called Sturgis City and was later renamed Saberton in honor of George Sturgis's wife. And it's gonna be historically categorized by its industrial factories and immigrant workforce, as well as poor living conditions and a vast uh, diverse communities. Next slide, please. The two main ways of transportation in Saberton were the railroad and trolley systems. So Sturgis again has his hand in these projects um, as an investor and as someone um, drawing them to the area. So the Morgantown and Kingwood Railroad um, comes through here and then the trolley system was extended from the Morgantown to include a Saberton line in about uh, 1903. Next slide please. And, and most immigrants uh, who settled in Saberton in the early 1900s were from Eastern European countries like Hungary, Italy, Greece, and the Balkans. Um, these immigrants were um, drawn to the area to fill the job vacancies at Saberton's many factories, uh, the most notable of which is the American Sheet and Tin Plate Factory, which was in operation from 1903 until 1931. Uh, by 1912, the mill employed about 800 people and had a payroll of $50,000. So this image shows the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company, uh, which later becomes Sterling Fawcett. Next slide. And the tin factory was not the only industrial site in Saberton providing jobs to these immigrants. Uh, these images show the silk factory in the Norwood edition on the left, as well as the Pressed Prim Plate Company on the right. There was also a Morgan Shirt Factory and coal mining in the area, well, which helped with the area's economy as well. Next slide, please. And as we've said, uh, Saberton was mainly an immigrant community. So in 1914, uh, a survey showed that there were 132 Greeks 103 Hungarians, 112 Italians, 14 Romanians, and 40 Slavs living in Saberton. Um, so only 27 people out of 530 living in the neighborhood had been born in America. And so those numbers really show you just how prominent immigrants were in Saberton. Um, and with that, language and culture were barriers within this community, um, especially between workers and American businessmen, businesses. So the managers of the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company's Saberton Mill provided an Americanization school uh, using the classrooms of a Saberton school building um, for their workers. And other groups involved in Americanizing immigrants in the Morgantown area included the Daughters of the American Revolution, or DAR, and Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, and these groups placed more of an emphasis on women as men were working in integrated environments within the factories and industrial sites, women remained in off, often ethnically uh, divided communities. Um, so West Virginia's DAR chapters distributed the American Creed, held English night schools and essay contests on patriotic education in the region. Um, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union organized mother's clubs, held children's story hour, uh, citizenship classes and English lessons, as well as calls to foreign homes. Next slide, please. So these images here show you some of the housing conditions uh, at Saberton, um, specifically along La Stravia Avenue. Um, so it's classified and characterized by uh, very, very high rent. The homes were often overcrowded, sometimes up to 22 people living under one roof. Families often would rent, or if they own their home, then they would live in one room and bring in other boarders. Um, Again, often unsanitary conditions, uh, garbage was allowed to, to accumulate in vacant areas and offensive open drains near gardens or street line cars were common. So a nurse uh, who was hired by the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company um, states in an official report um, that, quote, if an, if an epidemic were to break out, 
there is no possible means for isolation or quarantine, end quote. So despite these conditions of the neighborhood, uh, Saberton is still a place where immigrant residents lived, worked, and worshiped. Next slide, please. So th these, um, this slide shows two other um, buildings in the area. There's the commercial building on the left, uh, which is still standing but vacant. And then there's also the duplex on the right, uh, which has been demolished. Next slide. And as I said, Saberton was really a community uh, for these immigrants and their families. Um, they even had a baseball team, which was called Saberton Workers, made up of the industrial workers from the area. Um, but there were also grocery stores, bars, uh, churches, and schools. Next slide, please. And churches uh, were incredibly important, um, especially as companies often sought to Americanize the immigrants. Churches were spaces where they could keep some of their traditional customs of their homeland alive. Um, so what we see here is uh, Saberton Methodist Episcopalian Church on the left and St. Marcella's Greek Orthodox on the right. Um, and there's also Saberton Baptist in the area. Um, but specifically St. Marcella's Greek, Greek Orthodox Church um, was organized in 1928. Um, and it was attended by many of Saberton's uh, Greek immigrants. Um, and this parish offered supplemental educational classes um, to the children. Um, so after their regular school day was over, they would come to this church um, and they were taught the Greek language, history, and geography. Um, by 1931, St. Marcella's after school classes had about 50 attendees, uh, and, and the number um, increased from there on. And these education classes were a significant way for the Greek immigrants to resist the pressures of Americanization and feel a sense of community with those of the same heritage. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Liz. Next slide, please. Um, and as Jordan mentioned, schools uh, were an important part of uh, Saberton's community history. Uh, there was one large school that was built in Saberton in the north end of Lestravia. It goes by different names, um, but I usually call it Saberton School. Um, it was founded in 1909, and it educated students elementary through high school um, at different times during its tenure, and it was open until the 1990s. Um, it was one of the largest schools in its district, and it, with increasing population of um, residents in the area as well as children, they had multiple additions on the school, including a coveted gymnasium. Uh, most uh, neighborhood schools in Morgantown did not have gymnasium, so that was uh, special. And, but besides public education, as Jordan was saying, the school was used for Americanization classes for adults, um, as well as community gatherings and uh, church uh, gatherings and events. Uh, unfortunately, the school has now been demolished, um, but it was an important part of the community for over 100 years. Next slide, please. So to get back into what our survey was, um, 18 students sur helped to survey 212 structures in Saberton. 76 of these had been previously surveyed but, um, in 1983 and 2010, but most had not been surveyed or um, they definitely needed updated. So um, there were very few that were considered eligible. And when we completed our survey, um, 180 nine were not eligible and you'll see why as I show you some images but many do not have integrity today um, and have had all, lots of alterations or are in poor condition um, but most structures are residential in the area many commercial structures and industrial su structures are no longer standing um, a few structures have been recommended for individual listing and I'll show you those in a moment and one small historic district was recommended um, most structures and you know homes and businesses in the area were built between 1900 and 1930, which aligns closely with the period of industrialization in Saberton and West Virginia more broadly. So it was it was very rewarding for us as students to be able to do the research on Saberton. Uh, we not only learned a lot about the overall history of Saberton and its buildings, but we le learned about the people who lived and worked there, um, and we were able to know who lived in each house, what people did for a living, and imagine what life might have been like 
and Saberton's industrial heyday, as well as decades since then. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of residential structures in Saberton. You can see that many structures are similar in style, although this was not a company town like um, you might have seen in, in southern West Virginia coal, uh, coal towns, there was consistency in um, the style of houses, and many of them today have been altered. The exterior materials have been changed, or they are in um, poor condition. Some homes in the Norwood edition are um, not yet 50 years old, so they were ineligible as well. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there is quite the commercial strip in Saberton with fast food restaurants, gas stations, and um, some grocery stores. And, both, and a lot of those are um, you know, newer construction in the last 40 years. But there are a few uh, original commercial structures still standing, including a gas station, which has been re renovated, and um, that grocery store Jordan had mentioned earlier, which is still standing on Lestravia. Next slide, please. These are two structures that have been um, recommended for individual listing. The building on the left is a, a community house, which was operated by the American Sheet and Tin Mill Company. And this was served as a community center. They hosted classes for women to teach them how to cook, clean. Um, the medical care was provided, child care was provided. And this is all part of an idea of corporate paternalism. Um, although the company didn't own the houses and didn't um, control people's lives as closely as you might see in um, a coal town, um, there was still this idea of the company um, mentoring it and kind of almost controlling its workers. And the building on the right is um, a little bungalow cottage that sits behind um, the Harner Homestead, which is the original farmhouse um, uh, that was, you know, Saberton was that one large farm. Next slide, please. So this shows um, the proposed historic district. You can see that the brick homes are in excellent condition and were built by the same architect and are almost identical to each other. Um, the homes that are across the street, which is that top left picture, are large and more high style. And the school also sat in this area, but as I said, there it has been demolished. There was a fire um, a few years ago after it had sat vacant, and um, a developer purchased the home last year, or purchased the school last year, excuse me, and um, demolished it to build high-end condominiums. Next slide, please. And as Jordan was saying, the religious communities were very important in Saberton, and they are still vibrant today. Um, unfortunately, the exteriors of these buildings have been altered dramatically over the years, so they're not eligible for a listing, but the congregations are still very active. Um, and the Greek Orthodox Church, I believe, celebrated an anniversary just last year. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Jordan to finish everything up. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges and rewards of our project. Um, so some of the challenges we uh, faced um, were as far as the, the building structures are concerned, just poor housing stock, um, whether it was demolished, altered, or in poor condition when we were conducting our surveys. Um, when it came to research, some lacking or elitist sources um, I know a few of my peers had issues uh, with deed research and, and going back a number of years, um, but in general, um, being able to highlight Saberton as a, as a working class and immigrant community, um, which often hasn't been um, given as much credit um, or, or celebration as it deserves. Um, how to recognize and celebrate um, their own buildings, buildings that are historic but not necessarily high style um, and represent the working class and impoverished pop populations. Um, other rewards in addition to just uncovering these forgotten histories and stories um, is that we were able to shed light on an area of Morgantown um, that's often just discounted as a commercial strip and blighted area. Um, Help the Morgantown Historic Landmarks Commission um, with some additional data and moving forward with Saberton. Um, and then from the perspective of students, um, not only was our research and work put into this official report, um, but a few of my peers had their work published as articles. Um, and then also we received good uh, field experience um, for going out into the neighborhood 
um, and conducting these historic property inventory surveys. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our colleagues, colleagues to discuss their projects. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Elizabeth and Jordan. So um, our next presenter is Adrian Thompson. Take it away, Adrian. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Danielle also and PA West Virginia for all their hard work. Um, and also thank you to everyone tuning in with us today. Um, so I began working on this project at the beginning of my senior year at WVU um, and very quickly found an interest in evaluating um, the former African-American school buildings uh, and uh, seeing how they could be uh, used uh, or rehabilitated for active use um, and also preserved as historical markers showcasing African-American history and culture in West Virginia, which is unfortunately a big portion of our state's history that is often overlooked. Um, so many of these buildings have unfortunately also been demolished um, or remained abandoned and have become dilapidated over time, um, which erases a great portion of uh, their importance and integrity. Um, next slide, please. Um, my research was conducted through the undergraduate research program at WVU um, in conjunction with the pre-existing African-American school project. Um, Dr. Thornton and I established four main research goals, um, and the last two were uh, the ones I focused more on. Um, they were all essentially to uh, first gather and record any information on historic African-American schools in West Virginia using resources like archival materials, maps, online databases, and a variety of websites like Clio, Sanborn Maps, which Elizabeth briefly mentioned, and the Library of Congress's uh, digital archives. Secondly, um, to conduct interviews with former students of West Virginia's historic African-American schools, which Jamie Abilman will be speaking uh, more on shortly. Next was to locate surviving structures formerly used as black schools and assess their physical conditions. Um, and finally, to identify former schools that could be potentially be potentially listed under West Virginia's National Register of Historic Places, uh, which I will touch on further. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, currently, we have discovered the existence of nearly 400 African-American schools in West Virginia since around 1870. Um, this project is still ongoing, so it's very likely that there were more um, that we haven't seen. There's not a lot of information, so it's a little hard to dig through the archives to find, um, find them. But a, a majority of these schools were located in rural mining communities, primary primarily in the southern portion of the state. Uh, I think McDowell County had the most because it was primarily a mining area. Um, most of these early structures were small one-room buildings made of wood, um, while more modern buildings were made of brick or stone. It contained several classrooms, although few possessed modern amenities found in uh, most white schools, such as indoor bathroom facilities, proper lighting, and heating and cooling. Next slide, please. So prior to 1954, all public schools were separated by race. However, the Brown versus Board of Education case deemed racial segregation in public schools unconstitutional. So schools throughout the Southern United States gradually began to desegregate and both white and African-American students consolidated into integrated school systems. Though some schools integrated slower than others, all public schools in West Virginia had integrated by around the mid to late 1960s. Since the former white schools were undoubtedly better equipped with facilities and resources, many former African-American school buildings were either abandoned or demolished entirely. Um, and without proper maintenance, a majority of these standing structures have become dilapidated and total disrepair. So we're going to be looking at a few of these examples. Next slide, please. Um, Jamie and I, oh, excuse me. This is the uh, Bramwell School or uh, the Bluestone School located in Bramwell in Mercer County. Um, it closed in 1964 uh, when students integrated into the nearby Bramwell High School. Uh, the Bluestone High School Restoration Committee began a stabilization project on the building in 2000 and repaired some of the roof and secured the windows, but the building itself is still abandoned. Next slide, please. The conjoined Gary Grade School and Gary District High School in Gary and McDowell County is another abandoned former African American school that has suffered greatly from lack of maintenance and weather conditions. Next slide, please. Um, this was a school actually that Jamie and I had the opportunity to visit. Um, it's known as the Greenbrier Hill School in Marlinton in Pocahontas County. Um, although the building does suffer from some water and structural damage, the interior integrity is still sound and fairly good. 
Um, however, like many others, the building remains vacated and has been abandoned for several years. Next slide, please. To combat more buildings such as these to coming to disrepair, it's incredibly important uh, for these structures to be potentially listed under the National Register of Historic Places, which can provide current property owners of notably historic buildings, districts, and sites with preservation benefits and incentives that can be used to maintain the stability of historic structures over time. That way, these schools can remain intact while being utilized as active and occupied spaces. Um, there's more information on the National Park Service's website, which I absolutely recommend everyone go check out. Um, next slide, please. So some of the preservation and rehabilitation efforts in West Virginia uh, that have been conducted through these African-American schools. Um, start with the second Ward Elementary School in Morgantown in Monongahela County. The building was placed on the National Register in 1992 and the interior was remodeled by a member of the North Central West Virginia Home Builders Association to create two modern studio and five loft apartments, which are beautiful. Um, and the exterior has remained largely the same um, and has retained that historical integrity, but has been cleaned and repaired. Next slide, please. Um, next, we have the Weston Colored School in Weston in Lewis County, uh, which was placed on the National Register in 1993 and is currently being used to house the Mountaineer Military Museum. Um, much of the exterior has retained its original mission or Spanish Revival architectural style and has also absolutely retained um, its historical integrity. Next slide, please. So the main question um, is why preserve historic, historic African-American structures and why is it important? Um, though we are engaging in preserving the physical structures, we are also in turn working toward preserving and protecting the physical embodiment of underrepresented African-American communities, activism, and early education in West Virginia. Uh, this also preserves the sense of place for people of color in the state. Um, these structures can also be used as hands-on educational tools in representing African-American history and early educational struggles for people of color in Appalachia. Finally, uh, rather than demolish the buildings or allow them to decompose, these spaces can be utilized in a variety of ways, including as schools, community centers, office space, museums, and community outreach facilities. So uh, thank you so much all for your time, and we're going to move it over to uh, one of my other research colleagues. Thank you, Adrian. So our final presenter today is Jamie Billman. Hi, everyone. This is Jamie. Uh, I'm going to kind of pick up where Adrian left off as we worked on the same project, but I went more towards the oral, oral history aspect of it. So next slide, please. So for me, this project has definitely been a few years in the making. Uh, I started with uh, Addie on the historic preservation side of this, working with our class to find African-American buildings. Uh, and then I went on to do an independent study with Dr. Thornton in order to create a, a library exhibit for the uh, Appalachian Futures exhibit that the library was creating in which we talked about uses of buildings going forward. Um, after that, I decided to take the oral history class with Dr. Thornton and I would end up doing a graduate assistantship with her as well to continue that project. So next slide, please. So starting in the oral history class, we were able to do 18 oral histories total so far. And as Addie hinted at, um, integration in West Virginia was a very um, unique process between different counties. So it was definitely important to us to make sure we represented as many counties as possible. So just to highlight the variety of counties, I listed a few here. We were able to interview people from Monongalia County, Preston County, Harrison County, Kanawha County, Monroe County, Mercer County, Pocahontas County, and uh, several others. Um, but all this speaks to how um, different each county responded to Brown v. Board, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So next slide, please. So much like uh, Addie talked about why preserve African-American buildings, the next question maybe then is why this oral history topic? Well, as um, my colleagues have mentioned, there is definitely a gap in the archival record when it comes to certain minority communities. Um, we see that in our project prevalent in a lack of African-American sources, but as Elizabeth and Jordan mentioned, it's also very common to see in respect to immigrant sources. 
and working class sources. So uh, with how fast of a process integration was, there was um, definitely a lot of documents that did not get uh, moved over in the process and are unfortunately lost to us. So uh, it's definitely been a lot more of a hands-on experience than I thought it would be. Um, the other reason to do this oral history topic is because um, African Americans who attended segregated schools are an aged population. And so the longer we wait, the less likely we will be able to continue this project, the less interviews we'll be able to do, and unfortunately, the less reliable some of their memories will be. So um, it was kind of important to all of us involved to kind of get the ball rolling as soon as possible. And then I think it's also important that we allow um, African Americans the chance to talk about their communities themselves. Um, it's really easy to look at, you know, maybe a few primary sources, a few secondary sources and draw conclusions about um, what African communities in West Virginia looked like, but it's even more richer of a source if they're saying it themselves. And so I think it's really important that we allow them to talk about their communities, maybe the hardships they've endured, but also the accomplishments that their communities have um, created and definitely the people who have come out of these communities. West Virginia has a strong African-American history to it with very notable African-American figures coming out of the state like Booker T. Washington and also Katherine Johnson for which Johnson Space Center is named after. So next slide, please. I thought I would share a few oral history project tips uh, before I get into some of our results, just because uh, I thought maybe some of you would choose to endeavor to do a project like this yourself. So um, I would definitely recommend talking to everyone when you're looking for someone to interview. Um, Gina Anderson, who we interviewed from Pocahontas County, was recommended to us by another public history teacher who ran into her at an ATM in Marlington. And so you just never really know when you're gonna find someone who kind of meets the criteria you're looking for. And so it's definitely important to um, just kind of just talk to everyone. My next tip would be to come prepared with questions, but be prepared to go off script, especially when you're looking at a topic as specific as the one that we were looking at. You definitely need those guiding questions, but people do tend to go off topic. And uh, it's important to, to see how they got to that um, trail of thought, because oftentimes it is related to the question you asked, um, but eventually you do need to stay on topic. So I would also say follow-up questions are key, especially when they do go off topic, because this is something that's going to be archived and people uh, hopefully for time in memoriam will be able to access it. Uh, everything kind of needs clarified from the get-go. You really don't want um, any anything that would lead to misinterpretation or maybe just isn't clear in general, so that um, people using this for, for instance, research papers are able to, um, you know, be as accurate as possible. So next slide, please. So this is an example of um, some of the work we did, I thought I would just pay a little clip from it. Um, this is Ed Hargrove. He attended segregated schools in both Mercer and Monroe County, uh, which is a very unique experience even amongst African Americans who attended segregated schools because he actually integrated in Mercer County. And then when his parents moved to Bluefield, he went back to a segregated school, which really highlights um, how different the experience was county to county. So um, I think you should start the clip around 120. Um, if you can, please. Okay, I'll do my best. Just a second. Okay. I have see. to give. Let me see if I can't. So you'd like to start at 120, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm not hearing any audio. Let me try again, just a second. Okay. Algebra was a little bit of a, uh, it, it produced a little bit of a problem for me. And, uh, uh, 
I didn't get much help from the teacher to to get me up to a certain level there. The one course that was giving me problems, algebra, there was a lady who was a teacher at Park Central High School, the all-black high school in Bluefield. And I do believe she was a, a mathematical genius. Her name was Virginia Abair. And she took me aside and she said, I saw from your previous grades that you didn't do well in algebra. And I said, I didn't. She said, what about it bothered you? And I said, well, I couldn't understand this, this. She said, let me sit down over here. And in 15 minutes, she took that cloak of, of uh, danger away from the, the algebra. Uh, and I said, is that all there is to it? She said, that's all there is to it. And after okay. that, I think I'll that's a good amount. So I think um, that video, I think, definitely highlights um, how oral history sources differ from other primary sources because you have the video and you have their actual voice. It's a lot easier to get more out of it. It's, it's a richer source in some respects because maybe if you're just looking at um, written text, you, you don't necessarily know if something was said in jest or if something was a rhetorical question. And it, when you have that video in front of you, it, it really um, makes those things clear. And I think that that's a lot of something that a lot of people um, should consider more when they're doing primary source gathering. I think oral histories can be a little overlooked for uh, the benefits they provide. So next slide, please. Um, the last step with an oral history project is transcriptions, um, which are definitely the bane of my existence, but I figured I'd talk about them anyways. Um, they're, they're a lot harder than they sound, especially for people who aren't familiar with the transcription process. So a few little tips I have for that is definitely familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the Baylor Oral History Style Guide. It provides you with some really good um, kind of bullet point things to always be keeping in the back of your mind that, um, you know, help kind of guide your transcription. And that's something that you can easily access with a Google search. I would also definitely give yourself plenty of time to do a transcription. It's definitely not something you want to procrastinate about if you're on a deadline because it will always take longer than you expect it to. And then because of that, I do think you should try to go slowly. Um, if you go slowly the first time, you might only have to go back and revise once, but if you just keep going through it fast, you'll probably have to keep going back and revising to get it to um, a more perfect state. And then my last tip would be to utilize online transcription software. There are a few available, for instance, Temi, where you can upload, I think it's 45 minutes of um, audio on a free trial and it will provide you with a Word document. Um, of the uh, transcription of the audio you uploaded, but you still have to edit it off afterwards because um, it is just using uh, text to uh, speech or speech to text. So uh, it gets you a good starting point, but it's definitely um, useful. So next slide, please. So the last thing I did uh, last semester was I turned this into a paper for my writing seminar class. Um, because we had a few uh, interviewees from uh, Monongalia County, I decided to look at the Osage bombing. Um, for instance, Charlene Marshall attended Osage Elementary School, who we interviewed, and that is where the Osage bombing took place. Uh, like Dr. Thornton said uh, in the introduction, I do have a media studies background, so I decided to look at how the media coverage surrounding the Osage bombing differed from other integration related bombings that happened in Appalachia. And then I got to use these oral histories to set the stage about how African Americans thought about their schools and about integration, which was really kind of fulfilling for this project to go full circle for me. And in that sense, they were also uh, invaluable resources that got in my paper. So that's my last slide. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. Okay, thank you again. Yes, and we will be taking questions now. So a couple things had come in through the presentation. Um, one thing that came in in the discussion about 
the schools when you guys were going through and showing some photos of schools that are still standing is some good news that the Bluestone School in Bram Bramwell was recently purchased and is being converted into an ATV resort and restaurant. So that will be preserved and hopefully maybe you know someday they'll put some kind of interpretive material out there about what's going on or, or the history of the site. Um, so I've also sent out the links in the chat and then you'll receive an email tomorrow with extra links in case you aren't able to access those through the chat. Um, so the first question that came in at the beginning during the discussion about Saberton was, were settlement houses common in Morgantown, Monongalia County? I'm assuming by settlement houses, they mean when, you know, somebody comes new to the area, somewhere for them to stay until they find more permanent housing. Um, I don't know of any specific to Saberton, but I do know that many people hosted boarders in their own homes. And um, so I would say yes, tentatively, although I don't have records right in front of me to prove that. Um, I know other examples. I did uh, some research on um, Helvetia in Randolph County, and there was a small settlement house there at the beginning of um, when they just founded Helvetia. So there are examples in other immigrant communities where settlement houses were common, and I would venture that they certainly, that they probably existed in um, Saberton as well. Hope that answers the question. Okay, the next question that came in was about adaptive reuse in historic districts. Even if an old structure doesn't have historic integrity, could the age of the building itself still make it eligible for historic preservation tax credits if the building was being developed for commercial purposes? I can actually answer this one um, because in the question she's asking about if it's pre-1936, so there used to be a tax credit available for historic for buildings old buildings that were built before 1936 it was a 10 percent tax credit but when the federal government redid the tax laws part of some of the tax credits were removed and that was one of them so the only historic tax credit that is available now is for buildings that are listed or found eligible to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So they could be com um, contributing buildings in a district and be eligible for the tax credit. Um, if it's, the church needs to be, so she mentions if, an example, a church converted into a different use. If the church is found to be historic and eligible for the National Register, then it would be eligible for the commercial rehabilitation tax credit. So let's see, um, if anyone else wants to send in. <clears throat> okay, there's some couple other questions, messages coming in. A discussion about settlement houses, they were run by groups like the DAR, which you mentioned, where immigrants were Americanized language hygiene citizenship lessons. So any other comments on that, Elizabeth? Um, no, that, that makes sense to me. I don't know of the DAR running a settlement house specifically in Saberton, but it does uh, align with the research that Jordan and I have done, as well as our other colleagues who are in um, that class with us. Um, and I know the, the DAR definitely has some settlement schools in other parts of the country. Um, I'd have to do some more specific research and digging to see if they ran one in Saberton, but I'm not aware of one at this time. One person says, I know Scott's Run Settlement House in Osage may have archives or records available. Also, probably a good idea to look at West Virginia Wesleyan for this kind of research. Okay, thank you for that comment. To, yeah, to speak to that, the Scotts Run Settlement House records, I believe that there are some of those available at the West Virginia Regional History Center. Um, and a lot of these settlement houses were run by re religious organizations. And the Scotts Run area, I think the Methodists and the Presbyterians both had like missionary type 
um, activities going on. So uh, looking at West Virginia Wesleyan is probably a good idea. I would agree with that. Another comment is Rock Forge Neighborhood House in Delslow may have also started as a settlement house. And West Virginia Wesleyan College owns a former black school in Buchanan. It is essentially abandoned. I think that that's WVWC. Make a note of that. Um, let's see, a lot of comments coming in. No other questions yet. Let's give it another moment. Okay, one more question here to the students. What was the most memorable, interesting thing that you turned up while working on the project? Um, I can speak to that. Um, I, I mentioned Ed Hargrow in my um, um, slides. He, I, I just, I, when I started this project, I, I knew integration differed between counties, but to see someone who actually integrated and then two years later moved to the county next to him and had to go back to a segregated school was so fascinating to learn about how different those experiences could be. Um, that definitely was a very memorable uh, thing I, I learned throughout this experience. Jamie also briefly mentioned the Osage bombings, um, which I found, uh, I mean, they're absolutely heinous, but I found um, the response from so many people um, around the world uh, was, I mean, it was just unfathomable. Um, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt spoke about it. Um, many church organizations spoke about it and how um, obviously it was um, probably, uh, racially spirited after uh, integration. I think it occurred in uh, 58, which is four years after the Brown versus Board of Education case. Um, so that was definitely, um, it's very, it's absolutely sad, but it was really interesting to look at. Uh, and for me, I think what I enjoyed the most, um, I, my focus was on the school in Saberton, um, and I was writing the National Register nomination for it, and then they decided to demolish it. Uh, which was unfortunate, but I um, there was an alumni Facebook group actually that I interacted with um, people who had gone to school in um, in the building. Um, some people were there for grade school, some people were there for junior high, other people may have been there for high school for a short time. But I really enjoyed interacting with the alumni and getting resources from them and information from them. Um, and I to echo what Jamie was saying about looking at oral histories and sources that aren't necessarily in an archival box, you know, tucked away somewhere, but looking outside of the box and um, talking to people, I think was really beneficial and learning why the school was so important to preserve. And sadly that, um, you know, that didn't come to preservation, did not come to fruition, but it was still very rewarding to be able to research um, the history of the school itself. And I also was on the Saberton project and I think um, in addition to just kind of uncovering stories that we wouldn't necessarily um, consider or, or weren't considered traditional history, more of this working class and um, historic neighborhood, but also going out to do the field work was one of my favorite things to do, actually, um, to go walk about the neighborhood, um, take pictures, and then con conduct condition reports and, uh, and assess the architecture and just see how the neighborhood that we researched in the archive had changed and how and how it is today. I thought that was really interesting. So I also in sent a link out that discusses um, is an Ele Eleanor Rose discusses the Osage bombing. Um, in case anyone wants to check that out as well. Thank you. They're they're um, very. I actually had not heard about that beforehand, so um, I appreciate you guys sharing that information. 
At this time, I don't have any other questions that have come in. Um, I just want to thank the students and Dr. Jennifer Thornton for being with us today and sharing their projects. This information will all be added online to the Preservation Alliance YouTube channel by the end of the day, and you'll receive the links that we've shared in an email tomorrow. But feel free to share this around um, with anyone, and we'll be doing webinars once a week until the end of July for now, hopefully extend through August and into September. So check out our website for more information. It's pawv.org. Thank you all again for joining us. Hope you all stay well and are safe.